Welcome to your Nooner with Dooner back here in Chattanooga. Hope you all had a safe trip out to Cleveland or a safe trip back from Cleveland. It's a great trip. Got to see so many of you. I need to get out more often. It's a good time. Shaking lots of hands. But at every event, guys, we have a tradition when we do these things, and that's uh, having the guests do a little cowbell off. So let's see how everyone played over at the Future of Supply Chain. Cowbell? Yeah, hit me your cowbell. Yeah, here we, we go. <laughs> More cowbell. There you go. It's Kyler Ford at the beginning. There's Marcus Cooksey right there. Oh, there's Mustafa. Mustafa came strong. A lot of people reported hearing him while they were up on the stage. I think uh, oh, you're gonna, there Bart you from 344 thought he was getting gunged. Tyler the cowbell. Hughes okay, there you go. There we go. Fantastic. Woo. That's myself. Reed loosed a lot. Mm. Uh, sorry, on. guys. Yeah. Lost Hold frequently on, there. Reed, 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 sometimes Reed, I feel like you're a deeply Reed. unserious person. Uh oh. Yeah. There's Frank from Torque. Tom, Sorry, no one's on that yet. Me and Cody from Freight Waves. Yeah, we got to get a Coca Cola. And of course, from Coca Cola, right, Rob Haddock. All those shippers oh, yeah. of choice and future shippers of choice. I'm, I, look, I'm giving, I'm giving best in Cabell show two. The winner is, I'm giving it to Rob Attic, man. He threw out to the shipper of choice. It's an award I give away. Coca-Cola was one of the shipper of choice winners. So, hey, only fitting. Although, I think for, like, just sure violence of hitting the cowbell, it's going to go to Mustafa. Mustafa, you really brought all the energy towards that. Now, a quick topic that came up was uh, turning the iPad. You guys go shopping anywhere. Everyone's turning around. They want that tip. They want that 10, that 20, 25 percent. Someone brought up if lumpers should get tipped. Let's take a look at that right here. Uh, the community, I threw this one out them. Should we start tipping lumpers? J.L. Labbard says, saw it for the first time today. Not a fan. So he's actually seen this like live out in the wild. Actually, I guess some lumpers are looking to uh, all right, looking to get tipped. Fraser Kinsey said he's throwing down the Uno Reverso card. Daniel Matthew says, I think lumber fees are 100% a scam. Simple as that. Uh, Mauricio Solano, I mean, national carriers like USPS in the U.S. getting tipped. I'm okay with that around Christmas, but private companies for cargo? What the F? What's next? Tipping the drone robot for bringing my, my, my food? Ramel Watley from Truck and Hustle. I saw him over in Cleveland. He said, tip culture is at an all-time high. It's not about service or good experience anymore. It's now an upsell. And I love to tip, but it's getting exhausting. Trent Charlton says, well, lumbers, why shouldn't drivers get tip? They should turn the iPad around. Monica Thornton, personally, I'm tired of seeing every time I swipe a card, I got to pay. Steve Watson, depends on my mood, load and contribution to the load. Not to mention how fast and clean the unload was to help my hours of service. Ed Mave said, hell no, truck drivers should get the tips though. And Donald says, I wouldn't put anything past Capstone. One more thing here, this was a big topic as I was walking around the floor over at the Future of Supply Chain. We did a show on it, Yellow Goodbye, there was a big Freight Waves article, and it's a talk of the channel checks that are going on at Yellow. Craig Fuller tweeted this this morning. He says, channel checks suggest that the situation at Yellow is dire. Shippers that have historically been loyal to the company in difficult times are pulling freight. Labor situation is more challenging, and most downturns that impact LTL volumes, unemployment is higher, and the union has less power. Power. With labor winning so many concessions from employers, the Teamsters leadership feels pressure to stand their ground while Yellow's business deteriorates along with the freight market. Shippers pulling freight makes the situation far worse. And just to add to that a little bit, as I was walking through there, I won't name the executive, but one called, one said to me, the situation at over at Yellow is an irreversible death spiral. So hope they can figure things out over there. On today's episode, we're going to be joined by J.B. Hunt's president, Shelly Simpson. She's going to talk about leading through a freight recession, the mission to create the most efficient trucking company in North America, learnings from million-mile drivers, and the keys to culture. We get travelers Craig Lanner. He's going to break open the topic of carrier-to-carrier -carrier double brokering. J.J. Keller and Associates' Joshua Lovin gives us a crash course in DOT audi um, audits. We got Reliance Partners Brian Runnels. He is going to talk about the increase in trucking fatalities. What can we do about that? Plus, uh, should you tip your lumper? We already did that. Getting fit in your truck, warehouse drones, and the infamous $100 pizza. But Craig is here right now, so let's bring him up. Craig Lineauer, Inland Corporate Cla or Inland Marine Corporate Claims over at Travelers. Craig, welcome back to the show. It's great to be back. How are you? 
It's been a couple months, haven't it? I, I think last time you were on, we were like getting ready for reefer and we were talking about collisions and spoilage. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it seems like I was just here, it was probably a few months ago and we were talking about, uh, you know, the most common transportation claims then. Uh, and I think I had mentioned that uh, the most common are collision and breakage, but uh, you're right, the biggest increase has been in spoilage claims to perishable cargo, which is up, as I mentioned then, about 30% year over year. So, Big topic, big topic over when I was in the future supply chain in Cleveland, big topic on what the truck all the time, especially this year, has been double brokering the increase um, in fraud that's going on. It sounds like it can get you in a whole lot of trouble. What is like, what is travelers, what do you guys see on this topic? Well, you know, this is a really big topic right now, for sure. And I know recently you heard from Elizabeth Simpkins on your show, and she's one of our underwriting officers. Um, she was here to talk about carriers, shippers and brokers and what they can do to protect themselves from double brokering. Uh, she also mentioned that double brokering usually happens when brokers and carriers lack capacity to handle uh, shipments. And that was super informative stuff. Um, but, you know, in the loss and damage world where I work uh, in corporate claim, we usually see double brokering in one of two ways. We either see broker to broker or carrier to carrier double brokering, uh, air quotes there. And each form uh, of double brokering presents risks and problems to, to freight brokers and carriers. Let's start at broker to broker double brokering. Just I, We've covered that quite a bit, but give us a brief uh, elevator on it. Yeah, so in broker to broker, what happens is the broker is hired by a shipping customer to arrange transportation. But then what it does is instead of arranging the transportation, it hands it off to another freight broker to arrange the transit. And this is done without the knowledge or the consent of the shipper. And so, you know, this really creates some dangers and risks for the freight broker. The biggest risk to the freight broker is that there's usually a freight broker contract which prohibits double brokering. And when it's violated, the penalties for double brokering are assessed against the freight broker. And here's the rub, these penalties usually aren't covered by insurance. Also, when the freight broker doesn't vet the carrier themselves, but instead they give it to another broker, they can void their insurance coverage that's available to them as a freight broker. So, so really in one fell swoop, the freight broker in this type of double brokering can void its insurance coverage and it can get hit with contractual penalties from its shipping customers. So it's not a great place to be. So aside from the threat of the contractual violation, there's also a big threat to communication. So there's a better chance that critical information like cargo special handling instructions, seal requirements, uh, delivery deadlines, and that kind of thing are gonna get miscommunicated when you introduce another broker into the mix. And this can lead to errors and delays and ultimately claims for cargo loss or damage. So. Aside from that, um, statistically speaking, also when we see with this, with this kind of broker to broker double brokering, when you hand off the vetting of the carrier to another freight broker and you don't do the due diligence yourself, it really increases the risk of theft, tampering or security breach. So if you're going to rely on another freight broker, you should always ensure that you know exactly who you're doing business with and you can speak to their process for vetting carriers. Again, with this type of uh, you know, broker to broker double broker, you can find yourself subject to contract penalties and also suffering uh, an uninsured loss. Craig, what if we cut out the middleman, right? Is there is there carrier to carrier double brokering too? Yeah, carrier to carrier double brokering is really pre prevalent right now. And what happens there is that the shipping customer or the freight broker hires the carrier to move the freight. But instead of moving that freight themselves, the carrier hands it off to another carrier, a second carrier. And this is done without the knowledge or consent of the shipper. And so, as I said, this is very prevalent right now in the, in the industry, and it's really fraught with problems. You know, right off the bat, the big problem with this kind of double brokering is that unless the first carrier actually has DOT authorized freight broker authority, that act of brokering to a second carrier is illegal and it can lead to fines. Additionally, much like the other kind of uh, broker to broker double brokering, when you introduce a second carrier into the transportation chain, it can lead to miscommunications and, and breakdowns in communication around things like special handling instructions or specific security requirements, temp settings, uh, that kind of thing. And this can increase the likelihood of damage or rejection at delivery. And then, you know, when one carrier hands off to another, if that, if, if that involves a physical transfer, um, then it's gonna require additional handling potentially. And then when that occurs, that increases the likelihood of improper loading uh, or unloading, and it increases the chances for unauthorized access or tampering 
uh, to the cargo. And and look, too often what happens in this kind of carrier to carrier um, brokering, double brokering, is that the carrier who's outsourcing the shipment doesn't confirm that the second carrier has sufficient insurance or even that they have DOT authority to transport the commodity that's being hauled, you know, the commodity in question. And so they really aren't conscious of the effect that double brokering has on their insurance or that of the of the freight broker who tendered the freight to them. So many times this simple act of double brokering can void uh, all potential insurance coverage. So they're coming at you from all angles. You got the carrier double broker. You got the broker double broker going on over here. What can they do to protect themselves? What can the industry do about this? Well, listen, for the, hey, for the industry right now, this is certainly a big deal and there's a lot at stake. Um, thieves are increasingly using sophisticated technology and AI to create elaborate theft schemes. Um, experts estimate that double brokering scams of this kind are costing the industry about $100 million annually right now. So it's a pretty big deal. And by the way, I should say that at Travelers, we have experts who can specifically speak to how to combat, you know, fight against double brokering theft scams. And in fact, one of my colleagues, Scott Cornell, is going to be coming up on your show next month, I believe, uh, to talk about exactly that. So you have you have that to look forward to. But in terms of your question about what can be done to safeguard against double brokering, it sort of depends on the parties, right? So if you're a broker, you should know exactly how your shipping contracts address double brokering. You should know that uh, penalties for double brokering are not going to be covered by insurance. Uh, and in terms of insurance, you should understand how your liability and your contingent cargo policies respond to double brokering. And then, of course, where possible, you should always try to vet the motor carrier yourself, validate that they're uh, authorized, licensed, and, and properly insured to haul the commodity. Um, and then as a carrier, uh, what you can do is you should recognize, again, right off the bat, that when you outsource a shipment to a second carrier, Without, a DO, without actually having DOT broker authority, it is illegal, which can result in fines that are not going to be covered by insurance, by the way. And then you can also double check your shipping paperwork at pickup, make sure that it reflects you as the carrier. Uh, and if you spot a strange party uh, in the paperwork, you should probably reach out to your dispatcher. And then as is the case with freight brokers, understand how your insurance covers double brokering in the event of a cargo loss. Do you have a scheduled driver or a scheduled vehicle policy if that's the kind of policy you have, you probably don't have coverage in a double brokering scenario. Well, so what's the moral here in this uh, awful double brokering story, Craig? Can you sum it up for us? Yeah, look, I would say if there's any moral, it's this. No matter what form uh, double brokering takes, whether it's broker to broker or it's carrier to carrier, what it does is it introduces complexities into the chain of transportation and these uh, complexities impact communications. They reduce transparency and also accountability. So, and all of that together contributes to an increased risk of loss, damage, or theft of cargo. Well, hey, how do people learn more information about all of this? I'm sure we've got, we've got a lot of gears turning in people's brains who want to, uh, who want to be safe around this stuff. Travelers.com. Travelers.com. Well, thank you so much. We learned a lot about what not to do with double brokering. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, it's an issue that comes up every single time I talk to people. So, folks, I hope you paid attention. Take it easy, Craig. Thank you. Thanks, right, you too. Everybody. Meanwhile, the aquarium. Oh! She, oh she's not putting that back. That, those weigh like 600 pounds. I don't know what his escape plan was after he landed on her, but I hope that lady's all right. Those, those are not, that's not a light animal. That's not a lap dog that just, that just fell on her. Might need some insurance for that one. Joshua Lovan, industry business advisor at JJ Keller and Associates is here with us right now. Hey, Joshua, how you doing this morning or afternoon? I guess it's afternoon Mayor. now. Doing great. Pleasure to be here. Really looking forward to it. What part of the world are you sitting in? I am in uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas. We're based in, obviously, J.J. Keller's based in Nina, Wisconsin, but I'm a remote employee and based in Fort Smith, Arkansas. So. Oh, well, very, very cool. I got the uh, I got their big sign right behind me, and then I got a big backer after you coming on here, Shelly Simpson from J.B. Hunt. So this is going to be a very uh, woo pig show. But for you, I got to <laughs> ask like you. It. DOT audits, right? Are DOT audits, like, for, actually, before we even get into increasing, um, in reference to them, what is the current state of affairs with DOT audits? You know, the, the pandemic, COVID-19, really kind of put the government behind the eight ball with social distancing, things like that. But coming off of the pandemic, uh, 
you know, the audits increased 54% in 2022 from 2021. So uh, they, they, the fines and penalties, we also, they they were up 40% last year, year over year. And in 2022, for an example, there were 12,500 investigations. And kind of what I thought was really interesting with that is over half of all audits completed last year involved companies with fewer than seven power units. So in a, in a lot of those audits, man, they were they were collected. They were they were kind of site specific uh, focused because there was an egregious safety problem like hours of service or hazmat. A lot of audits are triggered by like kind of headliner crashes. And uh, so you don't have to be a large carrier to get audited, as we talked about, over over half of all audits involve trucking companies with less than seven power units. So, well, so that was during the pandemic. As we, Like 2023, do you have any data on are, uh, are they increasing as we come out of the COVID pandemic? Yeah, we really feel like that they, they are increasing and, and, and we'll get into why we we really believe that here in a little bit. But. But yeah, uh, in 2022, there were almost $26 million in fines collected. Uh, the average paid per settlement was, uh, it was only $7,100. But as you know, the, the, real, the real problems with uh, getting fined by the government, it, it opens you up to potential civil litigation and nuclear trials, nuclear verdicts coming down the pike. Um, but the, uh, the top fines of 2022 were, were kind of what you... We, we normally kind of expect them. There were 790, almost $800,000 in CDL and hours of service fines. Uh, the top hours of service fines were almost $100,000 coming in at $92,000. And uh, anytime, again, with the hours of service theme, if there's a deliberate uh, falsification, we saw fines that were $88,400. Uh, and then your drug and alcohol testing fines were hovering around that seventy-five to eighty thousand dollar mark. Those are all increased uh, seven, eight percent year over year as well. Do you know what the attributing factors are to this increase in audits? Yeah, and that's that's kind of the question that follows up that we get asked a lot, and, it, and it's pretty simple if you think about it. The FMCSA, FMCSA, DOT, they are tasked with reducing fatalities on our nation's roadways, and for the second straight year. Uh, fatalities were were over 46,000. Uh, so 46,000 people died on our roadways in the country in the last two years. And if you compare that to the pre-pandemic, we're talking 2019 and before, the mileage death rate has increased 22%. I mean, you talk about uh, a nasty number. That is a one in five. That is a significant spike uh, big trucks have kind of held steady with being involved in about 5,000 fatality accidents uh, per year since 2019. But uh, again, the FMCSA is tasked, their primary job is to reduce, eliminate fatality accidents on our roadways. And there has never been more innovative safety technology in tractors today than there ever has been. However, tra- uh, fatality accidents still increasing double digits. So I think that's the really the predicate that's the thing that's driving um, these audits is that you've got to get control of these fatality accidents and just continue to go up. Well, how can I, you know, I, I'm a fleet manager. I'm hearing this right now. I hear that the audits are up. I'm getting a little nervous. How can a carrier identify gaps in their safety program so they're prepared for such an audit? Yeah, that's a that's a great question as well. I, I used to be a director of safety and security for a really large LTO company. We had 14,000 employees. And what we did to kind of figure out how to how to increase CSA metrics, things like that, is we started doing mock audits. Uh, and, and it was kind of horrific what we found initially. At large distribution centers where there's maybe four or 500 people, everybody kind of expects somebody else to do the job for them. And we saw a lot of drivers just get straight into a unit and drive off without even doing a walk around. So how can you catch a lot of these uh, CSA-based issues like no placards, unsecured trailer or unsecured cargo, marker lights may be out, things like that, if you don't even walk around a tractor, right? So uh, the the best way is to conduct uh, self-audits and uh, mock assessments. And listen, a, a lot of carriers don't have the bandwidth. We all wear many hats in the industry, me included, risk management, safety, whether it's OSHA, EPA, or whatever, it's hard to stay on top of everything. So if you don't have the bandwidth or the industry knowledge, we always recommend partnering with a third partner like J.J. Keller 
that's obviously an optimal solution. Uh, what we do is, and, and what we encourage all carriers to do is focus on digital records. If you're using shoe boxes and filing cabinets to put paperwork and receipts in, it's 2023. It's time to kind of catch on to the digital world. It makes things much more organized, easier to spot problems. And, th and that's really important when you're talking about drug and alcohol files, the DQ testing and, and all your maintenance and, and inspection files that go with that. And the the mountain of the mountain of paperwork associated with hours of service. So really, JJ Keller and companies like us do do assist customers with doing those mock inspections, and, and that's really the first step in identifying what kind of issues you may or may not have. Interesting. Well, you've given us a lot to think about. Do you have any closing thoughts for carriers on what well, they need to be mindful this year with with this increase in audits? Yeah, that, that absolutely. I, I think. We always say conducting mock audits, it all starts with that. If you're trying to build a culture of safety and you're trying to take safety seriously, you have to know what you maybe not what you don't know, right? So that all starts with a mock audit. And if you if you don't have a lot of experience in this space, definitely consider partnering with a third party, somebody that's recognized in that leader in, as a respective leader in that field. They can kind of get you going down that right path. And really, it's all about teaching drivers and management about the focus areas of an audit. Uh, and then the second part of that is follow up with corrective action for all nonconformance issues. And I know that sounds cliche and boring and all that, but it's as simple as finding a violation and preventing subsequent violations. That's really what safety management controls are all about. And, uh, you know, that, that that's kind of what we do to support the industry, to support our wonderful customers is just try to get them ready if, there is kind of a, an, an audit in their future. Josh, hey, thank you so much for your time today and for stopping by the show. Where should people go to learn more about what you're uh, talking about here? Yeah, we're, we're easy to find. We're at jjkeller.com. Uh, we're on Facebook, YouTube, all the social media sites, and then obviously just on the web at www.jjkeller.com. And if you learn more, like to learn more about audits, inspections, other industry pain points, we do have a special virtual event this Thursday called the State of Fleet Management. Uh, we advise everybody to try to attend that. Kind of goes into a lot deeper depth of stuff we've been talking about here today. But again, thanks for having us on. Really enjoy these kind of events and uh, have a great day, brother. Yeah, go enjoy that Arkansas weather. Woo pig, take care. Yes, sir. Good See seeing you. you. All right, everybody elsewhere. Now check this out. This is, you know, gender reveal parties. I know they can be kind of controversial with some people. You know, there's only been a few forests set on fire. But these ones, they did it safe here. They got a semi-truck out here for their baby's reveal party. And as you can see, it's a diesel. No, it's a girl. I think that was peak pink and smoke coming out there. Who do you think picked that? You think the, the husband or the wife? Or do you think it was mutual? Maybe they're team drivers. What a way. What a way to announce your baby if you're a team driver. I like it. It's on brand. Shelly Simpson, president J.B. Hunt Transportation Services, Inc. is here right now. Shelly, it's been too long. How are you? What do we have? Do we have our volume up? Somebody? Guys? Somebody? Talk we're to me. We're good. Oh, we're good now. Hi, Shelly. We got you. How you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. How are you? You are, you know, I missed, I missed you over in Cleveland, but it was such an awesome party. Your team did an amazing job. I already knew the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame itself was going to be fantastic, but I was blown away by what Spencer and the, uh, the team you sent over there had done. Well, they said it was a great party, and of course, you know, I always hate missing those events, but Spencer went one way, I went the other direction, and uh, really tried to get more accomplished. Well, you look like you're having an awesome time over at the Ariz the Arkansas Arizona Arkansas Trucking Association Truck Driving Championship. Tell me a little bit about that event. I know JB Hunt gets deeply involved with them, and it looked like a great time. We even have a few pictures. Yeah, so we went uh, all week. We've been practicing. So we our drivers came in uh, last Sunday and spent the entire week. And you can see we've got our three award winners. Super proud. Uh, of their work, Philip, James, and Daryl, all representing us. And actually, Philip's going to be able to go to the national uh, competition here coming up. And so we're really excited taking uh, first place with James taking second and Daryl taking third in the sleeper category. So super excited. Always love to do that. So we had 25 drivers plus their families 
come in all week, spend some time. Oh, you get an opportunity to see our surprise guest, which was Mrs. Hunt. And so I got the opportunity to, to escort Mrs. Hunt to the drivers after they, they had spent, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday preparing. That afternoon, we spent some time with them. She told stories. Her stories are always so mesmerizing for all of us just to sit and listen. And I always tell people, hey, get ready for a real treat. You just kind of want to sit there like you're at your grandmother's house hearing stories about, you know, the good days and the today days and what's even um, brighter days ahead. So super excited to have Mrs. Hunt. And then we got uh, straight to, there we go, we're at the National Truck Driving uh, Championship. And so that's the day of the event. Spent time with drivers and their families. And then certainly that night got the opportunity to be at the award ceremony. So we it's kind of an all week thing for us at night during the day. And uh, certainly through the weekend, I think we were done Saturday about 930 at night. So a lot of fun. It's always a highlight for us, but it's just right here from our corporate campus about uh, three or four miles from us. So tons of fun. Well, I'm glad you had an awesome time. You're almost a year in now to being the president. I, I think it's August when I can actually like formally congratulate you, but you've been in it for 10, 11 months now. And you know, you were, it, it hasn't been the best time in freight during that period either. And you're one of the first executives to really acknowledge the freight recession and what's going on there. So my question for you is, how are you leading through a freight recession? Well, I think it's really important to be out and present with our people first, our customers second, and certainly really the people that support us, our owners, shareholders, all of our vendors, just making sure everybody knows where we're at, what we're doing about that, and what our future looks like. And that's probably what we're most excited about is the opportunity uh, that lies in front of us for all of us. So we are a growth company. We want to continue to provide great services and create more value for our customers. For us, that allows us to uh, be innovative and um, drive industry and growth and returns. And then we can reinvest back into our people, our technology, and our capacity. So that's important. I think one of the things that we've done that really happened for me, you know, I've served on our executive leadership team for the past 16 years. And I remember very vividly the Great Recession, which was, uh, you know, very difficult in 2009 to predict what would happen and how we would um, conduct business that would take us, you know, better over the long term. But I think we did a great job. And one of the things that Kirk Thompson, our then CEO, did was made sure that our people felt very safe through that process. We made a commitment then to do no layoffs, and that's the same thing we did when COVID hit, and it's the same thing we're doing now. And I think for us, it's, you know, the, the freight recession is short-term in nature relative to being in business for 61 years, and we have to be mindful of our cost um, in the areas that we can really um, reduce costs we're working on, but we also have the big picture in mind, which is it's not a matter of if, but when we're going to come out of a freight recession. It's really important for us to be strong on behalf of our customers. And so we're coaching our people through that. What are the things that we can do that make us strong on the uh, outcome of this? And one of the ways we want to do that is really one of our foundations, which we call people, uh, people you trust. And so it's important. We've grown so much over the last five years that we have a lot of new people. And so when they hear people you trust, it's probably something that they, you know, do a side eye to because they haven't had enough experiences. But this experience right here gives us the greatest opportunity for us to build trust with our people. And we know one thing, if we take really great care of our people, they're going to take really great care of our customers. And ultimately, that's going to take really great care of our shareholders. So we're focused on short term, what we can control, but we're going to work on the long term, which is the opportunity to create more value for our customers. Our people are really top priority for making sure that we do that. What do you think drives more innovation? Is it the good times when the war chest is overflowing or is it the tougher times where innovation makes you really have to think and be smart and get efficient? Well, I think it can happen in both times because if you think about, you have to be open to change. And so when things are kind of the same or just what I would say more static, there's not a lot of reason for change. You know, through COVID supply chain crisis, both customers and transportation providers had to think differently about how we would service our customers' needs and also how, you know, what's the best way to transport goods. So that was one way that we created a lot of innovation. But right now, 
we're having to think about innovation as well. And so how do we think about uh, long term, how we help our customers? What are new ways and different ways that we can really um, become more efficient? I think, you know, our mission statements to create the most efficient transportation network in North America right now is a great opportunity for us to do that. We've been sharing that supply chain costs are too high including our own. And we're working on ways to be more efficient. We want to make sure that we can share that back to our customers. And so now we're kind of on the other side of that. When you think about how a customer, how you create value, it's people, process, and technology um, that helps create that. And they always look for, um, you know, do you have capacity? Do you have the right service at the right cost? During the supply chain crisis, they were mostly focused on capacity today. Service is a given. They're very focused on cost. And so we have to be more innovative together on how we eliminate costs in the supply chain. So I think it happens any time that there is, uh, you know, a, a real shift from a supply demand perspective in either direction. And you can certainly see innovation coming through right now. Now, let me ask you this. Are you, are you a like a wartime president? Or are you a, a calm time president? You almost strike me as someone who's kind of who's hybrid. You're very adaptable to the situation. Well, I do love, uh, I, I love to think about the future. It doesn't bother me to be in what I would say um, an area of uncertainty if I, if I can understand where we're headed. And so I get ignited and invigorated by um, our future, but more importantly, I get ignited about our people. And so for me, um, you know, I want to be a great servant leader to our team, making sure that we are, you know, thinking long term about our customers. I don't know what kind of leader I am, but I am people oriented. Uh, I am financially oriented. I've, I've run P&Ls for a really long time. So that's important, you know, for us to be healthy and sustainable for our customers long, t long term. We have to make sure we do a good job with uh, our profit and loss statement. But, you know, people are really who make that happen. Have you had to amend your leadership style at all? Like, what are, what are you learning from people? Are they, are they easier in the good times? Uh, the people within your house, the people at J.B. Hunt, are they easier to manage in good times or in times when the market's a little bit more lean? And I think it's really, really cool. Something that you did there was you keep these championships and you keep these events going on. You know, you're not removing things that would suddenly make people skittish. Well, I mean, that's quarter our culture. So when you think about... Uh, are we really going to cut back on every single thing that made us really great for 61 years? Um, thankfully, we are a financially strong organization, although we want to be much stronger. Um, you know, I think the things that root into our culture over the long term are things that we, we have to continue to be focused on. Having said that, we are mindful of the dollars and cents that we spend. And so, you know, we might cut back a bit on, you know, part of this part of the program or that part of the program, but the core of what we're doing, I think is really important. You know, when I think about leading a team, I think you just have to understand the circumstance the team is in and then how, how to largely motivate. Um, I think that's important in either scenario. So I don't know if it's um, different or harder um, or easier. I think being connected though is one of the most important parts, especially going through this right now. And so that's something I think all of us are doing as leaders at J.B. Hunt, just making sure we're present with our people. I think I shared with you one of the things I wanted to make sure I get accomplished the first year was listen, learn, and connect. I've been to probably about 70 locations now, thousands of our people, uh, just making sure that I'm spending time and just learning a lot. You know, I'm new into this role, although I've been with the company 29 years, I'm, I'm new into this role. It's important that I'm connecting with our teams and, you know, is the process or the strategy we're coming up with resonating with our teams? And am I hearing anything new that we can think about? Same thing from a customer perspective. So I think being present is really important, really in any time. And so that's what I've, I've tried to be focused on. What have, you, what have you learned or what have you heard during this process of listening and learning? Well, I think one thing, um, you know, it is cliche. So many people say people are our greatest asset, but... Um, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Hunt really believed that. They really believed in people. So many of our people grow up in the organization and stay, you know, from hire to retire. And if you, if you get out and you see the faces of our people with 36,000 of our people, most of our people are located outside of where I'm at. And um, was no surprise to me, but what I've adored about being out is seeing our people, hearing our people, and recognizing really why we are great at what we do is our people do make a difference. 
Um, it's not cliche. It's really true. And so, um, you know, I had on our, our company foundations are people, technology, capacity. And I had on this T-shirt on Friday night, we had a, a dinner with our drivers and families. And I had a friend of a driver come up to me and said, hey, you're missing something on your shirt. And I said, what am I missing? And he said, safety. I said, no, I'm, I'm not missing it. Uh, he said, well, I'd love to hear your perspective. I said, well, who produces great safety results? And he said, well, people. And I said, you see people at the top of my shirt. Our people are what makes really great safety. And so when you think about the results of J.B. Hunt Transport, you really have to think about the people sitting in every seat, whether they're on the road uh, right now in Chicago, uh, taking a load to our um, terminal or a maintenance technician in Atlanta or somebody here in the back office that's helping facilitate, um, you know, goods to move. You know, those are the people who are making a difference every single day. It's really true about a business. I don't care what business you're in. People do make a difference in how they feel, how valued they feel, how welcome and heard and safe and respected that they feel during these times, uh, I think, to me, is the core. Were you on the phone with marketing right after that? And you're like, all right, we, we got to add safety to, to the bottom of the shirt. No, <laughs> no, because people are safety. Yeah. That's, that's it. People. People are safety. And so, um, you know, without great people, you can have a mantra all you want. Um, but you have to have great people. And certainly technology uh, helps us. Technology has been innovative for us as we've moved to inward facing cameras. Uh, with our drivers, that's a piece of technology, but our people have to embrace that and say, yeah, that's just one more step in creating an amazing safety culture. How did you um, how did you get that across to the driver? Some drivers, they, they don't like the inward camera. So how did you get your team comfortable with it? I know we a lot of conversation that we've had so far has been centered on trust, and I imagine that's got to be part of it as well. Well, for sure. And, you know, I think we have to listen a lot, and then we have to educate and make sure that we're staying in constant communication. So, you know, I can't say every single person understood exactly what we were trying to get accomplished. So that was important to us, making sure that we share and um, listen to what our driver's concerns are. But, you know, when they know that we are focused on their safety and their well-being, uh, as well as the motoring public, and they understand that technology can be an advantage for them personally, uh, I think they understand we're not there to watch people on uh, 24 seven. I think that's really important that we really are trying to become, uh, we want to eliminate all accidents. You know, that would be the best of the best. And so anything that we can do to continue from a safety technology perspective to evaluate and then determine how that best fits into our business is something that we're going to be open to. And um, so I think when they hear from that perspective and we listen to them and allow them to see the technology for themselves, I think we have quite a few champions that are helping us through that process. Now, Spencer, uh, Convoy, Uber Freight, they were on this show to make that big announcement a, a month, maybe it was two months ago, everything's starting to blend together. But I was curious from you, how? because you mentioned it before, you mentioned your mission, right? To create the most efficient trucking company in America. How does this collaborative consortium fit into that? Well, I want to just do a little uh, edit to what you said. Sure. It's actually the most efficient transportation sure. network. So we could have said transportation company, and then we wouldn't be thinking about you know, everyone in that. But when we think about our mission, it really is going to be um, putting the greatest of minds together. That includes really um, our entire industry to think about the waste that exists in the supply chain. And that's just one example of ways that we're trying to work more closely. It is a consortium, uh, which means we want as many people really involved as possible. And so it's not a software we're trying to sell together or it's not something uh, that everyone can participate in, so that shippers and carriers alike. So how can we bring the standards for our industry that really helps solve for a lot of the waste that exists? That's one of the examples that we're using uh, that helps us with our overall mission. You know, one thing I always appreciate, especially when I go on J.B. Hunt social media, is you honor your drivers, you honor your million milers, you have three million milers, you have five. Actually, what is the most million miler you have uh, at J.B. Hunt? We have three five million mile drivers. Three five million mile drivers. What do you learn from them and what do they teach you about culture that you hope to internalize and spread out through the JB Hunt ecosystem? Well, you know, they, they would tell you that safety is uh, key in what they do. It's something that 
we don't just say, but we try to live when you're in the cab of the truck, that becomes you know, the most important component for a driver to think about for themselves as well as everyone else. I love listening to our million mile drivers. They've been with the company for a long period of time. It takes anywhere from um, around 10 years, if, if you will, to, to achieve just 1 million miles. It's something that they know to wear with a badge of honor. And actually, when you achieve 4 million miles or 5 million miles, we actually put up a banner at our corporate campus. And you know, the, the big light poles that typically you'll see in like a downtown area, you'll see those banners with their names. This is how special they are at 4 million and 5 million miles. They are so special that they get their banner placed at our corporate campus on a light pole because that's how few four and five million mile drivers there are in the profession. And so, um, you know, there are celebrities, but also they have a great voice for us to think about what we should be doing differently. And they become our safety culture champions. They uh, really help us not only celebrate, but really ingrain that people you trust um, from a safety perspective, they're really the ones that make that happen. So we're very proud of them. And, you know, when you come to our corporate campus, we have a million mile wall of fame and those drivers get their names etched into that million mile wall of fame. It's actually sitting right out in front of our million mile auditorium. Um, and so that's something we celebrate, we honor them and we recognize it's harder to be in that million mile club than what many will uh, recognize or understand. It is, um, you know, like the top of the top of any profession. Um, very, very difficult. When you see a five million mile driver, whether that's at J.B. Hunt or someone, somewhere else, you just have to sit back and think, those are the drivers that make you and me comfortable going down our nation's highways that are really using the tips uh, that we train them from the Smith system with safety, making sure that people are safe. You know, as someone who is going minivan shopping after the, the show today with, with little kids, I, I very much appreciate that. Shelly, thank you so much for what your team does. You know, I, I, I love going out to your events and when you host them at ours. It's obvious that when you honor your million milers, you do anything internally, you throw just as good a party for your team. G great stuff. Good to hear about your leadership. People want to know more about J.B. Hunt. Where do I send them to? Very simple, jbhunt.com. Shelly, you're doing Lord's work out there. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks so much. Take care. Take it easy. All right, we got um, we got one more guest over here in the bullpen. It's Brian Reynolds, VP of Safety over at Reliance Partners. Brian, it's been a minute. How you doing? Good, sir. How have you been? I have been uh, fantastic. Just got my sea legs from being out in Cleveland, you know, Lake Erie, all that kind of stuff out there. But now I'm back in good old Chattanooga. Yeah, I, I had to get my uh, my flatland legs back underneath me because I spent uh, a week in the mountains uh, last Ooh. week. So, yeah, what, I had what to come back to the reality. Yeah. I was out riding. Uh, there's a group of us that get together every year, and we, we go ride the mountains for a week. So it, same week every year, same group of guys. We come from all over, and it's just it's a good, good break, but yeah, now we have to go back to work. So yeah, yeah, you know, and we have a we have a pretty serious topic today because we're talking about the increase in trucking fatalities over the last couple of years, and whether it's an operational or safety issue. So I got to ask you first, why is there incre an increase in fatalities, or, or how many is how big is the increase? Well, I I, I think the increase is is a couple reasons behind it. One just seeing a lot more aggressive driving uh, out on the road right now. And, you know, that stemmed, I don't know, a couple years ago, like when COVID was starting to wind down or people were starting to get more active, uh, we saw a huge increase in, in vehicle traffic. But I, I also think that it has something to do with the operational shift in freight, uh, meaning there are more trucks now in congested areas operating more miles in those areas than than ever before and and that's due to you know you you see distribution centers and and manufacturing facilities going up all over the place around major cities so i i think when you take that much equipment off of long-haul type freight and make it more regional uh, 
um, we're seeing drivers, you know, having to, to make a change in operation uh, as far as they're hitting docks more uh, to, to get unloaded and reloaded. So there's more pressure on them to get miles. And um, I think that's all playing into a reason that we're seeing an uptake, uptick in, in crashes and, and fatalities, unfortunately. You know, when this topic comes up, a lot of the a lot of drivers, their first response to such a topic is it's because we've lowered the barrier to entry. Right. They're just putting anybody in a truck. CDL standards are are at the bottom of the barrel. Would you say that's true? Does the data bear that out? Is this new drivers that are getting to accidents or is this across the board? You know, I, I think it's it's more across the board because, you know, the safety technologies on cars and trucks have increase so much in the last five to 10 years. I mean, it, it's weird to say, but it's safer now to get in an accident than it ever has been because of the, the safety technologies that are out there. Um, you can say it is due to inexperience. I'm not necessarily going to say it's due to, you know, the age of the drivers because, you know, let's face it, the average driver coming into the truck is around 40 years old. So I, I don't think it's necessarily... Uh, age based, but it could be inexperienced. But, you know, from many carriers that we talk to and, you know, JB Hunt watching, watching that previous segment, you know, they, they use the Smith system. They use different techniques to get these guys, get drivers to get a million, two million, three million miles. Uh, it's getting harder and harder to do that because the training takes time. It takes money. It takes uh, a commitment that maybe isn't as much there as it has been in the past. That's got to be that's got to be heartbreaking to be at like nine hundred and fifty thousand miles, and uh, you know someone backs into you or, or you get dinged. Uh, it, it can't be it can't be good. What what are fleets? So we know this increase is happening. Like what what are fleet? What are we doing about it? Or what should we be doing about it? Uh, yeah, well, I think, you know, the training and the awareness has to just continue. That 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 really has to be paramount in in your in your safety platform. I you know, using the technologies, having drivers understand what the technologies are and, and how to use them. Um and maybe it's something is the pay structure has to change for drivers. Uh, you know, I know that when you're based on a per mile basis, like we, we always had been in the past, the, the goal was say 3000 miles a week. Well, that just, that just doesn't happen as much as it used to. You, you could see the numbers, uh, as far as the average truck mileage was 92 or 93,000 miles three years ago. And last year it was around 80. So you know, there that decrease there, it's getting harder to get miles. And when your pay is mileage based, that could that could be a, a factor that's causing drivers to push, companies to push, dispatchers to push, trying to make revenue on those trucks. Um, because there there is a certain amount of work that a truck has to do to pay for itself. And if that's not being met, you know, and, and I think that's what we're we're seeing on some small companies right now is just because of where freight rates are and, and different types of things like that, getting the trucks to pay for themselves is a push. It's it's a real hard thing to get accomplished. Brent, what about like so I was just reading a report a few weeks ago here and it was saying we can't determine if ELDs have increased or decreased safety but if we're seeing fatalities go up like wh why aren't elds or or other safety devices we're putting in trucks doing a, a better job shouldn't this be going down well it, it should be and you know it all it, it kind of with the eld it plays back into if you're spending more times at docks and you're spending more times in congested areas going slower and trying to make up time when you get out of those because you are under a absolute ending of your day. Um, and I, I'm not saying paper logbooks were the answer. Uh, I've pl I spent plenty, plenty of time on paper logbooks. And yes, there is a little more flexibility with that than, than there is an ELD. Uh, but if you, if you work strictly within the guidelines, 
if markets are good, that that's simple, simpler to do. Um, when business owners are being, I wouldn't say threatened, but under the the fire of, hey, if this loads late, there's going to be a fine, or they're not going to use you any, the, the broker's not going to use you anymore, or something like that. Right now, trying to get freight is difficult enough. But if you start losing a broker, or you lose the ability to get freight from certain folks, then you know you you've got added stress. So I think that's why we see the the false logs and things like that is because they're trying to make more out of what's available to them. Yeah. Well, Brian, before I let you go, any tip for fleets here? Do they, they know these fatalities are going up? They don't want their truck to be involved in one. They don't want their driver to be involved with one. They don't want the motoring public to be involved with one. What can they do right now? Train and guide the drivers, number one. Um, you know, with, with different defend, defensive driving techniques and programs that are out there that are available, they work. Um, whether you're on two wheels or 18 wheels, it, it if you follow specifically Smith system, the way that it's written, um, it's pretty difficult to have an at fault crash. It really, really is. If you're following those things the way they need to be done, that's, um, that's real difficult to do and utilize and train on the safety technologies that you have on your truck. You know, if the, if the driver doesn't really understand, what they have and how to use it, it's not effective. Mm -hmm. So that is paramount as well to, to have everybody in your organization understand how these safety technologies work. And then the final thing would be, you're a professional. I understand that it's very tough out there. Um, I've been out there, I know, but it's, you are the professional and you have to take a, a step back and take, take a breath and, um, you got to do what's right because, you know, when there's a crash involving a big truck, it's always so much more, um, devastating than a car running into another car. Yeah. Brian, hey, thank you so much uh, for keeping us safe out here. I'll let you get back to nursing your saddle sores. I know you you had that big bike ride. I'm sure, I'm sure you're doing fine back there. If you yeah. want to learn more in the meantime, where do I send them to? Hey, send them to reliancepartners.com uh, on, you know, our social media platforms are always open for, for discussion and you can reach out to me as well. Brian, hey, thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks, Dinner. Talk to you soon. Take it easy. All right, everybody, before I let you go, let's take a look at a little strap work over here. This is, uh, usually these are, you know, horrific. You're probably expecting these things to snap, but once in a while, I show a good one, and this one, and usually it's because they're so good, right? They're so satisfying to watch. This is one of these, a box being dropped on the back of that trailer there. In fact, Rob Carpenter, he says, these crane operators are like drivers. You got exceptional ones, good ones, bad ones, but for drivers, rate the pin work is more like it. I can't tell you the number of Dre drivers that don't check and lock those chassis container pins. I don't think that happened here. This one looks textbook to me. Michelle Baker, she says, I would have never imagined a day when I would be glued to rate the strap work videos priceless. And they tell such a story about this underappreciated skill and science. Wow, former director here at the, uh, the Disney Institute. Jeff Dixon, he's got nothing more to say other than precision and Kelly Clements is absolute perfection. I got to agree with all of those. Now, here's another video. This one comes out of Bob. Who do we got here? Bob Kelly out of Fox 29. You ever been tempted to do this when you're stuck in traffic? This was on 95 back by Academy Road. You can see these idiot drivers right here. They realize they're stuck in too long a row of traffic. So they're just turning around, driving the wrong way and heading towards the exit. Where are the cops? Where's the cops, man? That guy needs a ticket. All right, what else we got? Oh, cruise ship chaos. You guys like cruise ships at all? Check out what was going on here. This is These were passengers on a Royal Caribbean ship over in Florida. And we get the volume up on this too. I want to hear this chaos. Yeah, here we go. Passengers are, passengers are struggling to stand on this ship. And as you can see, there's deck chairs, like projectiles flying all over the place. That one stroller, thank God there wasn't a baby and it almost got crushed. Apparently this was on the independence of the seas that occurred at port. They weren't even on the water yet. 
So imagine that there you go on your boat to go for your cruise, and next thing you know, grandma's luggage is flying across the pool. And as you can see here, people are just like, they're just trying to get to safety. I don't think people even have their rooms or are checked in yet. So you have them trying to use this, use the railing to guide, to block them from the seawater. But that person, I think, just got a deck chair off their head. Incredible. Incredible. Well, instead of going on a cruise ship, why don't you do a little exercise? I'll let this video play you out. Let's look at this driver and how he gets fit outside of his cab. A quick little workout, get a little dip bar, push-ups, dips. I used to do 20 of these at once. Now I only can do about seven. I'm getting back into it though. Make sure them abs is right. Go back to the push-ups. I drop all this flesh in Tennessee. <laughs> Let's get it. Get them hands ready for them chippers if they say something crazy. Uh, <laughs> I love it. Gotta get the hands ready for the shippers and sit in case they get something crazy. Hey, thank you for joining me on What the Truck. Find the show wherever you get your podcast. Find me on Twitter at Timothy Dooner. Hey, take care. And don't be a stranger.